More than 20 years of experience, Shane Lee takes an entrepreneurial approach to his work, proving that you can apply a creative process to marketing and communications. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Shane Lee Zhu. So occasionally I surprise myself and I read a book. And, um, and I surprise myself even more by retaining some of that information. So this presentation is going to be a compilation of a few ideas that I think are, uh, is important, uh, in some ways fascinating for myself, and definitely relevant to the folks that are um, in the audience here today. So thank you all for listening. My first story, oh, actually, I'm going to tell you three stories. Just want you to know, three stories. So my first story is about seeing what's not there. Abraham Walt was born in 1902. He was the son of a grandson of a rabbi, and he was the son of a kosher baker. He studied mathematics in the School of Vienna. There he was drawn to the, uh, the abstract theory, um, really obscure but pure mathematics. That was his love. In the 1930s, Austria was under economic distress, and eventually he, was, he emigrated to the US, where he landed at Columbia University, um, in a specific arm called the Statistical Research Group. The Statistical Research Group, which I'll call the SRG, was um, a secret sort of military arm uh, for the military. And it was there that Abraham Walt fought the war. The SRG was situated just west of Harlem, uh, near Morningside Heights, inside of a small New York City apartment. And inside of that little tiny apartment comprised of geniuses from all over the world. They would, they would be people that would compete and win Nobel Prizes. In essence, they were there to fight the war. So in 1941, there was a surge of new technologies in the war. There were submarines, there were radars, there was rockets, there were tanks, aircraft carriers. Warfare was waged in a way that was never fought before. And it was a lot more than just looking at your map and staring into uh, a set of binoculars. Right? There were complex mathematical scenarios that had to be comprised of. And the best calculators uh, that were out there in terms of machines looked like massive typewriters, right? Little old cash register machines. But they were nothing compared to uh, which, uh, the best number crunchers in the world, which happened to run on coffee and toast. Right? human beings. So the SRG essentially would be able to calculate things like um, the perfect arc for a fighter plane to take so that they could still keep the enemy fighter in their sights. They could uh, calculate the best ordnance mix for a fighter plane or the best propellants that would put into a rocket so that it could reach its target. Or they might calculate uh, the success rate of bomber flights. In essence, the people in the SRG were mathematical soldiers. Right? They weaponized their equations. During the war, if you were part of a bomber crew, your probability was, of living was a coin toss. Right? You, would you would fly for hours in a country that was hell-bent on murdering you, right? suspended in air in a, in a huge, huge vehicle that could be seen miles away. Right? And you were vulnerable from below, uh, you were vulnerable from every angle, flak from below, bullets from above, right? There was no way. I imagine, if you will, running across a football field, shirtless, with a bunch of angry hornets chasing after you. Right? You might make it across once, but imagine doing it again and again, right? Eventually, your luck will run out. So any advantage that you could have would make a difference day after day, mission after mission. And that was essentially the question that the commanders had given for the SRG. Commanders of aerial bombers presented this particular problem to Abraham Walt. How can we improve the odds of a bomber making it home? You don't want your planes shot down, so you have to armor them. But armoring them right, will make them heavier less maneuverable, use more fuel. Too much armor is a problem, but too little armor is a problem. So the commanders 
examined all the bomber planes that came back, and he very carefully cataloged all the bullet holes across each of the airplanes that made it back. And they looked at the damage, and they assessed where was the best place to put the armor. And judging from the bullet holes, you can see them. They were across the wings. They were across the fuselage. They were across the back end of the plane. And the commanders suggested to the SRG, why don't we armor those places where the bullet holes are the most? And Abraham Walt said, absolutely not. Because the bullet holes showed where the airplane was actually the strongest. Because after all, all those planes they examined actually made it home. Right? It was about the airplanes that didn't make it back. It was about the missing bullet holes. That's where the armor was actually needed. And you'll see from here, there are very few bullet holes around the engine, around the cockpit. The reasons planes weren't coming back with fewer bullet holes around the engines was because the, the planes that were shot around the engines weren't coming back. It was fairly simple. You see more people in the hospital recovery room that are shot in the leg and the arm, because if you're shot in the chest, you're not going to make it to the hospital recovery room. This is known as survivorship bias. And simply put, survivorship bias is a logic error. It concentrates on the people or things that make it past some sort of selection process. And it overlooks those, typically, that did not make it because it lacks visibility. Right? This can lead to false conclusions in several different ways. In the example of the bullet holes, the top commanders focused on just the planes that returned home, completely deleting from sight the planes that did not. And survivorship bias is a very powerful thing. It happens to us every single day. One of my favorite expressions for survivorship bias that surmises it right away uh, happened to me the other day. I'm driving my car around. This is a true story. Uh, I realize that there's an oil leak, and uh, the oil leak is going to cost me a fortune. And it's a, you know, it's kind of a, it's a 10-year-old car. I pull into the lot, and then I see a VW Beetle, one of those old ones, little air-cooled 1967 just floats on by. And I say to myself, by God, they don't make them like they used to. They don't make them like they used to. Well, the funny thing is that they made shitty cars back then, too. <laughs> and uh, right now, I'm just looking at the VW, the one that survived, the good one. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, I'm equating the entire era, that whole era of time, with great quality. But I would surmise that probably uh, they had... Uh, they probably even had it worse than we do now. So be aware of survivorship bias. My second story is about seeing things for what they are. This is Robin Warren. He's on the left of the picture. Robin Warren was born in Australia. He was a, his father was a winemaker, and his mother had a long line of, long tradition of doctors. He's always wanted to study medicine. And... Uh, he grew up uh, as an avid reader. He loved science books, uh, especially. Um, he loved photography. And he got his first Kodak box camera when he was 10 years old. He was very happy about that. Eventually, he went and studied medicine. And uh, the, funny, the peculiar thing about Robin was that he would illustrate all of his notes and photograph it whenever possible. Eventually, after school, he landed at the Register of Clinical Pathology where he uh, did what he loved most, which was exploration through observation. In 1979, he was uh, studying uh, some specimens, uh, specifically specimens from stomach ulcers. He took tissues from patients' stomachs and he looked through them and he was examining them and he found something very peculiar. There was a thin blue layer of cells that were lining portions of the craters where the stomach ulcers were, and they looked like this. Numerous of them, numerous. Uh, and they were spiral. And as he looked further and further, examined them more and more, he realized that they were actually living off of the stomach. And uh, all indications, all observations, led him to believe that these are actually bacteria, right? bacteria in the stomach. At the time, it was common knowledge that bacteria did not live in the stomach because of its acidity. Right? It 
It's just it, the acidity made the environment much too sterile for it to, for anything to grow. So, but once he saw it, he kept on seeing it, right? One out of every three uh, stomachs with ulcers had this particular organism living inside of it. And of course, his, uh, his findings were met with deep skepticism. No one believes or believed that bacteria could grow inside of the acidity of the stomach. So uh, consistently, he was met with skepticism. Everyone questioned his findings, but he persisted. And with his partner, Barry Marshall, who was on the right of that photograph previously, they faced up against the dogma. Finally, one day, uh, in a bid to prove his findings, he swallowed a pill um, filled with the bacteria. And you know, sure enough, he started uh, developing symptoms. He, had, he got sick, nausea, started vomiting, uh, and eventually fever and chills. And finally, he started to develop the, uh, the stomach ulcers. And that was proven by gastroscopy. So afterwards, he took a dose of, of antibiotics, uh, of which, of course, it took care of the, uh, uh, the bacteria and it allowed his uh, stomach to, to heal. So it was proven. So they published their findings, and eventually both uh, Robin and Barry won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2005 for their findings. And on his, during his acceptance speech, uh, he quoted Sherlock Holmes, which is, there is nothing more de deceptive than an obvious fact. And now we all know that hundreds of bacteria live inside of your stomach, and they actually help us with digestive processes. Yet the funny thing about this story is that in 1979, the same year that he was doing his explorations, the editor-in-chief of gastroenterology, I'm glad I pronounced that right, uh, studied a, was studying a group of volunteers. They all had the same infectious disease that was bothering the stomach, stomach pains, low acidity of stomach. Right? He did multiple tests for viruses because he knew nothing could, nothing could live in the stomach, right? Bacteria can't live in there. But later examination of their work revealed clear imagery of this H. pylori. In 1967, Susumo Ito of the Harvard Medical School biopsied his very own stomach with an electron microscope, found clear evidence of that, of H. pylori, a beautiful image of it, and nothing was ever done with that image. And I'll go further back. In 1940, Stone Friedberg discovered H. pylori in one out of three patients uh, that he uh, examined. And his supervisor told him he was absolutely wrong, and he made him stop his research. So in Warren's words, we found bacteria that everybody knew wasn't there. It's a bit like how people used to be certain that the world was flat. And we came along and said it was round. I could show them beautiful pictures of the bacteria, and they simply didn't want to see them. They simply didn't want to know. So why is it that so many people did not see the bacteria? Well, it's a, it's a phenomenon called uh, in, inattentional blindness. And in short, inattentional blindness is the failure to notice an unexpected object or event when attention is focused on something else. It's something that we can't see, we won't see, or our brain just plain doesn't let us see. And that's a pretty funny phenomenon. To explain a little bit that, there's some mechanics involved. Right? The visual pathway between your eyes and your brain is a lot longer than we might surmise. For each eye, there are two optical nerves, one for the left and one for the right. And these optical nerves circle back to the back of your head to the visual cortex, which is right back here. When it reaches the visual cortex, that information gets compressed by, 10, by a factor of 10. When, from that information, it then gets sent to the striatum. Right, and the striatum is in the center of your brain. When it reaches the striatum, that's, uh, it gets compressed by a factor of 300. Right? And then it gets sent inside deeper inside the striatum's core. And the striatum's core is where the brain decides what it's going to do with the information that it saw. And 
This is where all your experience, all your knowledge, all your assumptions of how things behave or how things should behave come into play. So in essence, the brain edits what is actually seen. Now this is not a bad thing because this is something that helps us focus. For instance, if you happen to be a, an, a radiologist uh, and you have to uh, examine x x-rays over and over again, you will be able to focus and uh, clearly see the things that are important to you while you know, taking things out. Same with uh, being a chess player. If you're a grandmaster in chess you're, and you've played enough games, you are able to focus on just the moves that make sense and not the entirety of the, of the, of the game board. But there is a danger to it because it's very powerful, right? This, this editing function from your brain. And uh, things can get in the way. So it's really about being aware of it, right? S being able to see things for what they are and not what you think it ought to be. My third story is about perception. And there's a theory called the Cambrian explosion. And essentially, it explains the diversity of animals on planet Earth. The Earth is about 3.8 billion years old. And the way the fossils work is that uh, diversity of life really only started about 540 million years ago. And according to the theory, it was because for 3.75 billion years, there was nothing but gas and clouds and fog on the planet. And finally, you know, 500 million years ago, that fog started to lift. And what happened? Sunlight started to hit the surface, started to creep through. So if you were a creature that existed during that time, you had better start uh, developing some sensitivities to that light because it would make the difference between eating and being eaten. Fast forward to our times now, 95% uh, of the animals on our planet have eyes. We live in a world of light and sight. We judge things by how they look, right? Within a tenth of a second, you will judge what a person is like uh, from the moment you meet them. Their trustworthiness, their likability, are their competence, are they, are they good at what they do? All that happens in a tenth of a second. Our perception, of course, is based on many, many factors. I'm only going to talk about two, color and shape. Our eyes can distinguish up to 10 million different colors. And color is known to shift moods. Right? The color red can uh, raise your blood pressure, uh, raise your heart rate, respiration, perspiration. And the color blue can actually do the very opposite. In 2012, German researchers had discovered that just a mere glance at natural shades of green could boost both creativity and motivation. So our brain actually stores images much easier when it's in color. It's, uh, and ads, advertisements that are in color, are retained 42% times more often. So it's pretty important. And yet, it's not just color, it's also shape. The Parthenon, as you all know, adheres to this funny little golden rectangle uh, shape that I'm sure you all have heard of. But the golden ratio is a is a proportion and a shape that is all over nature. It can be found in plants, crystals, uh, credit cards. It could be found in this 8 and a half, 11 sheet of paper that I'm using right now. It can be found in the, the face of the Mona Lisa, the iPod, even the, the Stradivarius. And this peculiar little uh, proportion, yeah, a little less than two-thirds wide as it is long, are the rough proportions uh, that are hardwired inside of us. So if you took your, go back to your eyeball for a second and uh, did a rough average of the images that are, travel from the optic nerves to the visual cortex and you outline the perimeter of that, the perimeter, the borders of that image that gets to your visual cortex is roughly a 3-2 aspect ratio. And it may have been a reason why Oscar Barnack who, in 1925, insisted on that, uh, on that aspect ratio for his invention, which was the 35 millimeter camera. So, but it's not just, it's not just theory there. This is, uh, I think there, are, there is some science to this. In 2009, Adrian Bejean theorized that 
uh, early humans, when they had to scan the planes, right? They had to look left and right. And uh, because of the horizon, uh, danger usually came from the sides or from behind, or behind you. Rarely did it come from above. So as a result of this hardwiredness, we have learned to scan left and right much easier than we do up and down. So a horizontal rectangle is a great way for us to uh, assimilate information, right? In his words, the golden ratio emerged as part of an evolutionary phenomenon that facilitates the flow of information from the plane to the brain. So it helps us perceive the world. And this world of perception applies directly to commerce. When Coca-Cola decided to show uh, solidarity with the polar bears, they said, what a great idea. Let's, uh, let's change our Coke cans uh, from red to white. Uh, the unexpected backlash was that many customers insisted that they had changed the formula. The color white, the white can, made the Coca-Cola taste different. Right. In the 1940s, margarine uh, was not selling too well. In fact, margarine was white in the 1940s, and they realized, hey, what the heck? You know, butter is selling pretty well. Why don't we just make margarine yellow? Sure enough, they changed it to yellow put a little foil around it, and now sales have skyrocketed. In taste tests for 7-Up, people have tasted more lemon or more lime based on the color, uh, on the amount of green or yellow on the label of the can. It's crazy, right? It's the reason why we prefer peaches in jars instead of cans, right? It tastes sweeter, fresher. It's the reason why we prefer ice cream in round containers instead of square boxes. This is a lot more. It's, it just tastes better, right? This is called sensation transference. And it was named by a researcher named uh, Louis Cheskin. In the 1900s, he observed that people's perceptions of products were influenced by aesthetic design. So sensation transference is important because aesthetic delight is a powerful motivator. It fires up those hedonic hotspots in your brain. It has been shown that, yes, brain scans have shown that if you are shown a, a beautiful, a well-designed product like an iPod or, or an Aeron chair, it actually fires up the synapses that control the motor cerebellum that actually govern your hand movement. So in essence, something that's really attractive we instinctively reach for. Beauty moves us. So those three ideas, survivorship bias, inattentional blindness, and sensation transference. These are ideas. They could be possible roadblocks, or they could be opportunities for your next big decision. Smart Funding Summit is the brainchild of Ryan Smeets. And when we were uh, putting, setting up this uh, show a few years back, we had to consider the brand identity. What was it that we wanted to say? And it came back to the people here in this room. Like all of you, leaders have to face uh, a few things. They need to be able to make connections, both <coughs> visible and non-visible. They have to be able to see past the dogma, the dogma that's in the marketplace, that's in the industry, and most importantly, the dogma that may actually exist inside your mind. And finally, they need to be able to embrace their humanity and understand that both uh, the beauty and the aesthetics and the proportions of things not only affect the product quality, but also they affect decision making and they drive motivation. So that, in essence, and they had to do all of that really efficiently. So that, in essence, became the creative brief for our logo. Right, the idea of making connections efficiently. So we challenged ourselves. How far could we distill the letter form so that it would still be understandable, recognizable, and aesthetically pleasing? And on top of that, how do we allow our audience, how do we allow their mind's eye to make the connection? And that's really what Smart Funding Summit is about. It's about providing the tools for you to make those connections. Our first conversation is with... Uh, is about building your brand, and it's with Michael uh, Spangenberg of State 48, 
and our own Ryan Smith. So thank you very much.